So first things first, let's get everything installed that you need to actually develop Spark code using the Scala programming language. Bear with me here, there's gonna be a lot of steps to follow and you do need to follow them very carefully. All it takes is one misstep or one typo here and there and things won't work. So do follow along and if you need to hit pause as we go to kind of like keep up with me, do what you gotta do. You know, take it one step at a time, hit the pause, do what I do and move forward. So it's very important you get this stuff right. With that, let's move on. So high level overview of what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna first install a Java development kit because the Scala programming language is built on top of Java and we need a JDK in order to interpret Scala code. We're then going to install Spark itself. We're gonna go download a pre-built version of it from the Spark website and all we have to do is save it in the right place and set a couple of environment variables so that your operating system knows where to find it. And finally, we'll install the Scala IDE itself, which is just a special version of Eclipse. You might have used that before in other programming you've done. And we can just go to scalaide.org to do that. Now, these installation instructions are going to be specific to the Windows operating system. I'm using Windows 10 here. But if you want to do it on some other OS, you can do that too. On Mac OS, there's a thing called Homebrew you might want to look into, and that can actually install Spark on your system with just one line of, uh, one line of code. So that's pretty cool stuff. On Linux, it does depend on what kind of Linux you have. So I would recommend just going off and uh, Googling, you know, install Spark on Ubuntu if you need to. The overall steps will be the same except for the WinUtils utility that we're going to install. It's just how you do it will be different. So the way that you actually set environment variables on a Linux system will be very different from how you do it on Windows, for example, and even different from one kind of Linux to, to another. So let's dive in and uh, get started. Let's start by installing a JDK, a Java development kit. So open up your favorite web browser and just type in JDK. That should bring it up. We're going to go to the oracle.com website to get that. And we're going to hit the JDK download button here. Go ahead and accept the license agreement and download the version for your operating system. For me, that's Windows 64-bit. And that will come down 187 megabytes later. All right, Chrome's gonna run a quick virus scan on it, and off we go. Let's open that up. And again, this is going to install a Java development environment because Scala needs Java to run on top of. Let's go ahead and hit next. Now, I'm gonna change the installation location for the Java development kit. And I just wanna make it something you can remember. So, you know, maybe uh, C colon backslash JDK. We're gonna to have to enter this into some environment variables later on, so it's important that you remember where it is and make sure it's going someplace where you have space for it. So let's go ahead. Standard Windows installer here, nothing special. We're just gonna go with the defaults except for the paths. And now it's going to actually extract the installer itself, which should kick off now. Now, why it doesn't remember exactly what we said before for the installation location, I don't know. It's a little bit annoying. So let's go ahead and remind it that we want it to go into the CJDK folder. And now the Java runtime environment will be installed. And we're done. Now next we need to set some environment variables to make sure that other tools can actually find Java and the, uh, the executables in it. So on your operating system, there might be a different way of, it, of setting environment variables. On Windows, I'm gonna show you how to do it, Windows 10 to be precise, but on Mac and Linux, you'll have to follow different directions. So just go ahead and look up how to set environment variables on whatever your operating system is. Probably involves modifying a bash RC file or a dot profile file in your home directory, but Again, it depends very much on your specific operating system. So if you're not on Windows, go look that up now, how to actually set environment variables, and then we'll come back here and take a look at what we're doing. On Windows, however, what we're gonna do is right-click on the little window icon here and go to Control Panel, click on System and Security, click on System, and then click on Advanced System Settings. And from here, we can finally get to the environment variables and we wanna add in a Java underscore home. So I hit new there, Java underscore home, and I'm gonna set that to where I installed Java, which for me was C colon backslash JDK. Another thing I have to do is add that to my path. So if I run Java from someplace outside of where I installed it, Windows can still find it. So I'm gonna highlight path up here in my user variables and hit edit. And I'm gonna add in a 
new path that's going to use percent sign java underscore home percent sign slash bin and what that does is reference the java home environment variable that we set and say we want the bin folder underneath that to be part of our system path hit ok and hit ok again i'm going to leave this up because we're going to have to come back to this environment variable page for spark so this next step is only going to be important if you're on windows if you are on windows and you probably are I want you to download from the resources on this lecture the winutils.exe file. And wherever you download files on your computer, go there. Hit pause and go take care of that right now, please. I'll still be here. All right, once you have that winutils.exe file downloaded from this lecture, go find where you downloaded it. Right click and hit copy. And go up to your C drive and make a new folder and call it winutils, just like that. Now inside that WinUtils folder, open that up and create a new folder in there as well called bin. Okay. And now open up the bin folder and paste in that WinUtils.exe file that we downloaded. Next thing we need to do is set up an environment variable to tell Spark where that is. Spark won't work without this file on Windows, so it's very important. Go back to your environment variables and create a new one under your user variables. And we're going to call it Hadoop underscore home, just like that, all uppercase. And for the value, we're going to put in c colon backslash winutils, which is the folder we created for it. All right, and with that, we have a little extra thing that Spark needs to be happy. We can move on with Spark itself. So next thing we're going to do is install Spark itself. So let's go to spark.apache.org and hit the download button up here. And uh, right now, the latest release is 1.6.1. If you see a newer one, go for it. And this is very important. You don't want the source code package. You want a pre-built one, pre-built for Hadoop 2.6 and later. You do, don't, don't forget to do that. If you do, it won't work. And we'll go ahead and hit download Spark. Again, the pre-built version. And we'll use whatever mirror they recommend. That's fine. Now notice it's actually a TGZ format. Now you might not have a, a utility on Windows already to open TGZ, TGZ files. That stands for tar and gzip, which is really a Unix file system file format. Now if you do need something on Windows to open that sort of a file, I would recommend WinRAR. Just type in win, WinRAR like that. You can get it from rarlab.com and you can just go ahead and download and install that if need be to decompress that TGZ file that came in. So let's go ahead and take a look at that file we downloaded. With WinRAR I can just right click on it and say extract and it will decompress that file for me. Again, if you're on Mac or Linux, you can just use command line tools to unzip that. And let's take a look at what we got. So hit refresh here. I should see it at the top of my list somewhere. Here it is. And inside we have something that looks like that. Now again, we want to move this someplace where it's going to be easy to remember. I don't want to leave it in my downloads folder because odds are that won't stick around forever. So on my C drive, I'm going to create a new folder called Spark. And in there, I'm going to copy the contents of the Spark package itself. So I'm just hitting Control-C here to copy, Control-V to paste, and there we have Spark. So just like we did for the JDK, I need to set some environment variables so that other things know where Spark is. Let's go ahead and do that. Back to the system properties here, we're going to hit environment variables again, and we're going to add another new user environment variable. This one's going to be called spark underscore home, and that's going to be set to wherever you installed it. For me, that was C colon backslash spark. If you have another root drive that has more room, maybe it makes sense to put there, but just to keep things consistent, we'll go with that. And just like with the JDK, we're going to add that to our path as well. So edit the path. Add a new environment variable. We're going to reference the spark underscore home variable that we just sent. And again, add the bin path to that. All right, so double check things at this point, OK? We should have java home slash bin and spark home slash bin in our path. Again, those are surrounded by parentheses, uh, sorry, by percent signs. And make sure that you have a java underscore home environment variable set to where you put java. The JDK, and make sure you have a Spark home environment variable set to where you installed Spark. All right, that's all the hard part. 
We can go ahead and close out of the uh, system control panel there. And the last thing we're going to install is the Scala IDE. And to get that, we can just go to scala-ide.org and go ahead and download it. So get whatever makes sense for your OS. For me, it's Windows 64-bit. Go ahead and get that. Notice that it has a requirement of JDK, which we already installed as our first step. And that should come down in a couple of seconds. All right. Now, the thing with Scala IDE is that it's built on top of Eclipse. So there's nothing to install, really. You just uh, go ahead and unzip that, right click on it, extract all. And we'll wait for that to decompress. There's uh, quite a few items in there, so it will take a little bit of time. Through the magic of video editing, we'll come back when that's done. Okay, it finally decompressed and left us open in this uh, extracted folder here that contains an Eclipse folder. And all we need to do to install Eclipse is to copy this folder someplace where we're not going to lose it. So I'm going to hit Control X to cut that out of my downloads folder, and I'm going to stick it on my C drive. Paste. And that will just copy it over. And if you want an easy way of getting to it later on, you might want to consider creating a shortcut to where you put that. So if you go to open up Eclipse, Eclipse.exe is actually the Scala IDE itself. So you might want to right click on that, drag it to your desktop and say create shortcut here. And that will make it a little bit easier to get there in the future. All right, let's just make sure everything's working at this point. So if you right click on here and go to command prompt, I have a handy dandy prompt for this in my taskbar, but if you don't, you can just go here. And uh, let's CD to where we installed Spark itself. So that was C colon backslash backslash Spark. Obviously, if you're in a different OS, the path will be different. So on Windows, I'm going to do a DIR. See what's in this directory on Linux or, or Mac OS. It'll be LS. And looks like we have some stuff in here. There's a uh, changes.txt file. So let's do a little simple Spark program to count up the number of lines in that file. So let's type in Spark dash shell. And that should bring up an interactive Scala prompt with Spark all set up for us. Looks like Windows Firewall wants us to open a port. That's fine. Hit Allow Access. <clears throat> and that's pretty cool. So we have a Spark environment spinning up here. All these info and warn messages are normal, so don't worry about them. But look, we have a prompt. We can actually write some Spark code. Let's do that. So here's your first Scala code ever. Val text file. Pay attention to case it matters equals sc dot text file open parentheses quote changes dot text all right and we actually just created an object in spark called a resilient distributed data store based on top of that big text file so now we can just call methods on that thing text file dot count for example and that will count up the number of lines in that file, 34,960. So uh, what's in there? Let's do like a text file dot, I don't know, um, take 10. Huh, gives me a little array of the first 10 lines of the file. Pretty cool stuff. So hey, it's, it's actually working. We're actually writing some Spark code here. How cool is that? Now, uh, if you're seeing some error messages or something like that, go back, double check your environment settings, make sure that all those environment variables are correct, make sure everything's installed that you need. If you follow those instructions, it should be working. If not, go ahead and post a question on the course and we'll try to help you out. But at this point, you should have a working Scala environment. Go ahead and quit it. Put an exit command and we're back to the command prompt. Believe it or not, you've probably gone through the most tedious part of this course already, just getting everything installed and set up. But now that we have that behind us, we can start to have some fun. So stay with me in the next lecture, and we'll actually start playing with some actual movie ratings data and put that Spark installation you just put together to good use.